Hello, it's me, Kyle. Welcome back to Give Paws Hobby. This time with the final of the currently eight available root bots, the River Folk Robots. Um, no, not the Rivet Folk. They didn't go with that name. River Folk Robots um, is uh, is the like I said, the eighth of eight root bots available, um, and it's fantastic. I'm not gonna lie, me kind of distilling everything I know about it, uh, my experiences in, my experiences into this script um, has really opened up the benefits and the, the cool aspects of it. And in, you know, I don't know if it's just like a culmination now, but it is not quite as challenging as I remember it being. Um, so I hope it will bring some interesting plays to your table um, like it definitely has for mine. So uh, without any further ado, let's get into it. Except quick reminder, um, this is A in the order of the uh, Law of Root Botics. I will use visuals from the board itself, but if you're following along at home, um, there will be times when I'll talk about things because they come up next in the Law of Root Botics, um, even if they don't come up next on the board. Uh, also, if I make any mistakes, I'll do my best to uh, make adjustments right at the top of the description. I'll put any like, whoa, heads up, I'm, I misspoke here, or I wasn't super clear. Um, if anything is uh, really kind of big, put your Klingon subtitles on. Uh, I will put, you know, the, the information down there. If anything's enormous, just something totally wrong, I will make another episode. Uh, I guess this is episode 8, 8.1 or something, saying like, hey, I did not do justice to this thing. And if it's just like super duper terrible, I'll just redo this whole video, which Hopefully that doesn't happen. Hasn't happened yet. Um, so anyways, uh, let's let's get right into it. First up, uh, the name. Riverfolk Robots. I'm not going to lie. I'm not as... Th I, I know last week I kind of gave some... Uh, the guff to the logical lizards, and then I came around to him at the end. If you stuck around for the whole video, um, I Rivet Folk was just so good. I don't I don't know why that wasn't uh, that wasn't a finalist, and if it was a finalist, why it wasn't the final winner. Um, River Folk Robots is just kind of the artwork is again so amazing. I don't know. I feel like of all the names. All the interesting things they've done, like puns for these these root bots, this one is the least inspired. So, I mean, mechanically, uh, this is one of the most impactful bots you can add to your game. So, we're going out with a bang. Thematically, based solely on the name, not so much. Let's see about the overview. Uh, if you need a shiny sword or a good boat, the river folk can supply. The more services you buy from them, the stronger they become but they'll turn nasty if no one buys anything from them. Watch out, these robots don't rust. <laughs> All right. Um, peek behind the curtain. I don't read the overviews uh, before I read them here on camera. I I've read some of them before just for my own uh, purposes, but that response to the don't rust thing was a genuine first response uh, to that line. So let's get to the actual board now. River Folk Robots. Now, I did mention last time that the uh, Logical Lizards and the uh, Rivet Folk, um, which I'll probably just keep calling them, don't have a ton of extra space for pictures, but that's not true. They have the, the lovely fishbowl uh, otter right down there at the bottom. So it's not quite as full as I made it seem. Pretty close, but not quite. Um, so up at the top, <clears throat> you're going to see our favorite friends, Poor Manual Dexterity, Hate Surprises, if you don't know what those mean, that means you've probably happened upon this video without seeing episode zero. So in the corners, it's gonna be a uh, link to episode zero where I talk about the law of robotics. And the um, there are a couple pages, two of them to be exact, that affect all of the bots. No matter what you're using, um, there are rules you need to know uh, that, that are going on behind the scenes beyond the rules that are specific to each bot. And I talk about those there. Um, the only other berries that are there are market. 
the market is a row of face of cards. The order of its cards cannot change. So this is like for sale, the human version of uh, River Folk, but it's not that your hand is open, um, which can ebb and flow based on how many cards you have at any given time, and also you only start with three. Uh, market is specific. It is five cards from the very beginning of the game, as you'll see. Its order cannot be changed. Um, so again, it is one of those times when it's not the same exact rule, but it's near enough that they want to have something that is uh, similar. Um, so a couple of secret berries which is to say they have rules in here, but they don't appear on the board. Um, trade posts. So your trade post down here in the corner, you'll notice a couple of things, uh, well, one thing, that uh, the victory points are different. So they're no longer two points for every trade post. It is zero points, one points, and two points, um, which uh, is because... A, you need to pull trade posts from your left side over to your right, and B, they do come back. So unlike the human river folk trading posts, when they leave the when they leave the map, they get destroyed. They don't go back to the board to get rebuilt again like the cats can with their buildings. They are just gone. Um, that is not the case for the rivet folk. They come back here, which means they will cover up the you know if you have two fox. Uh, trade post on the board and your next one is going to be worth two points but someone removes a fox one it's going to cover up that so if you place a fox one it only gives you one point instead so there's that back and forth nature um, and there's different uh, victory points for the different columns before we move off of trade posts, there's a couple of uh, things that I want to cover um, remember we already talked about how they don't get like X'd out of the game they go back to the trade post tracks if they're removed uh, we talked about how the victory points are actually different based on column, but also whenever a player removes a trade post, remove half of their warriors from payment, round it up. Half of their warriors. Now that's different from the human uh, otters because they are removing half their funds. Funds don't exist. We only have payments. We don't have the payments that go into funds that go into return to people. So. Um, you are incentivized to bring the fight to the otters because if you do so and you remove some trade posts, if you have, or I guess you're incentivized if you've been paying for stuff because then half of your troops get pulled out of payments. Sorry, there's some like duct work or something going on in the hallway. Now also, not on the services or the, spoiler, not on the berries, services. Uh, Ta-da! So you will notice that there are not the the three like tracks that you place the cool little beads, the glass beads to, to show how much things are going to cost because services work, they're the same thing. What you can buy, hand card, riverboat, mercenaries, works exactly the same as the human uh, river folk. However, the way uh, and also when you can purchase it is the same thing. It's the beginning of your bird song. However, how you pay for it in terms of uh, the cost is a totally different system. Um, so just to review, for those who maybe haven't played um, too much of the River Folk, uh, the hand card, the, you know, the market where you have those five cards up for grabs, you can buy any one of those. Um, so that's one service. Second, River Boats. River Boats, not at K. If you purchase that service, you can treat rivers as if they were paths for this turn. So you get to come and go as you please. Um, and uh, when it talks about treating rivers, remember on the lake map, that is, uh, you know, this, well, the original river folk um, preceded the lake map. So at the time, the river was the only body of water uh, or, or is a river considered a body of water? Anyways, is the only water that was in the game. So they didn't, uh, they just called it what it was, which was a river. Um, the lake counts as the same thing, even though obviously lakes and rivers are different. So you could uh, go from any one of those port clearings, just like you had access to the ferry, um, or if there were paths between all of them. And last but not least, mercenaries. Um, for battle, and rule in daylight and evening, you treat river folk warriors as your own, except for battle against river folk. You can't have otters fighting themselves or their own trade posts. 
In battle, you must split hits between your faction pieces and Riverfolk warriors. So if you do purchase this, you cannot just kick the otters underneath the churn of battle. You need to take hits too. So if you take two hits, one of them has to go to your faction, one of them has to go to the otters. Um, and there it is. So <clears throat> that's how the, or those are the services that you can purchase. Um, in terms of cost, it's going to work the same for humans or root bots. Just to say, if you have zero to nine victory points, it's going to cost you two. If you have 10 to 19, it's gonna cost you three. If you have 20 or more victory points, it's going to cost you four. So uh, a cool thing about this, morning recording strikes, um, is this is catered to, uh, or customized rather, player by player. So the player that's in the lead um, you get to say, no, 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 it's going to cost you more without having to raise the price of those services to the point where the, the players further behind are like, I can't pay that, um, which is not a thing you can do as the human river folk. So that's kind of interesting. Now, a reminder, it said that if you are human playing with the rivet folk in the game, you can buy one service at the beginning of your bird song plus one for every clearing that has a trade post and any of your faction pieces. So you always get one, and then it incentivizes you to be in those clearings with, uh, with the trade posts if you want to get more. And the same thing applies um, in terms of if you are the Vagabond, um, you're going to be exhausting items and using the otters for your payments uh, that, that worked like that before, same thing if you're using the robot otters. Now, for the bots, if you're playing with root bots in the game, you're going to decide at the beginning if you're going to use advanced or basic services. So you have your advanced, you have your basic services. Um, and you can actually cater, again, customize this faction by faction. All right, so basic services. Bots can buy services anytime on their turn. When buying from a rivet folk bot, they may buy any number of services, and humans, we still have to follow the normal limit. Um, bots must be able to afford the services, and they will not buy services if they have fewer points than the rivet folk, human or bot. Now, this is not a rule that's explicit to us humies, but it's a good rule to follow. If the river folk are way off in the lead, maybe don't keep buying things from them, bot or no bot. Um, and then again, the service cost depends on the bot score. Zero to nine points, 10 to 19, 20 plus, two, three, four, respectively. Um, so basic services for the bots. Hand card, when a bot tries to craft, but its card has no available item, either because it's not a craftable item or the craftable item card doesn't have any more of those tokens in supply, it buys a market card that has an available item. This card replaces the card that bot tried to craft, which is discarded. And it says this can change the order card. So if you buy a rabbit card that's dead in terms of crafting, and there's meanwhile a mouse card with a craftable item, you get rid of that rabbit card, uh, either to the lost souls or the regular discard, and you take that mouse card by paying whatever you would need to for the service. If there are multiple market cards with an available item, the bot buys the one that has the highest listed points. If there are multiple such cards, choose one at random. This is the first time you'll hear that choose one at random um, and resist the urge to go, oh great, and pick them up and then ch -ch 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 and then pick one. Because remember, the market, card, or market cards need to stay in order. So get creative. Uh, assign numbers based on the battle dice and roll them. It doesn't always work out. If you're, it's a tie between three things and there are four numbers on the dice, but you're smart enough to handle it. Um, and that's hand card. River boats, simple. Bots do not buy the river boat service on basic. Uh, mercenaries, if you battle in a clearing with two or fewer of your warriors, buy mercenaries if any river folk warriors are there. If you want to place a building, but you cannot place it anywhere, buy mercenaries if it would let you place a building somewhere. So a couple things. First, remember, you need to split hits between the faction purchasing and the otters if, you, if they purchase uh, for mercenaries. 
Uh, the root bots aren't going to remember this on their own, so you need to remember it for them. Secondly, you don't... Oh my goodness. I'm back. Um, you don't need to have your any pieces in the clearing that you place a building if you purchase that mercenary service. That just adds to your rule. So you can suddenly have gain, or reach in a clearing where you had nobody before. Um, so that can be pretty useful. And then down here are some specific rules for the different factions. Vagabot, exhaust one item for each service bought. Not per cost, just one item for each service. So even though you will pay four warriors if you have 21 points um, for whatever you buy, you're only going to flip over one item to do it. Um, you will pay with Riverfolk warriors and you cannot buy mercenaries. Simple as that. Automated Alliance, pay with Riverfolk Warriors. Hey, that's very kind. That is not how Human Alliance works. Um, so kind of a nice little buff for the root bot there. And Logical Lizards, never buy bird cards. That gives me a very Bears, Beats, Battlestar, Galactica vibe. Um, all right, so those are the basic services. Now remember, you can play with that. It's super streamlined if you have multiple bots in the game and they're all using the same the rules for that. Um, but most people, especially most normal people, aren't going to be playing with three or more bots at one time. If you're out there doing it, my hat's off to you because I am too. Um, but So if you're only playing with one or two bots, then I would really recommend you making the other non-Rivet Folk bot a little more uh, catered towards what that bot wants to be doing. So, uh, I mean, I would use these pretty much all the time, except in one case, and I'll get to it when we get there. Uh, introduction to Advanced Services. You may use any Advanced Services cards to improve the interactions of specific bots with the River Folk human or bot. If there is a rules conflict, the advanced service card takes precedence over the basic service cards. So this, the, you know, on these cards, there may only be one thing. The Cogwheel Corvids will only, it only has a rule for hand card. Doesn't mean they won't ever buy mercenaries. It just means this is the only thing that changes. It will still follow the basic services cards, which again, adds to the complexity, but makes it a more true uh, experience, I feel. Um, but if these cards ever come in conflict with the basic ones, these ones win out. Um, so I have ordered these in uh, the seven cards here in terms of the least complex to the most. Um, so you can go ahead and think what that might be, a little play along at home. Um, we're starting off with drum roll, please. The Vagabot. Um, the Vagabot, it's really simple. It's just river boats. When targeting clearings for any action, treat rivers as paths. If you do move along a river, buy river boats and do not exhaust the item for the move. Um, so this is the importance of saying the bots can A, buy any number of, uh, of services and B, at any time in their turn. So they're not gonna look ahead and say, oh, it'd be advantageous for me to buy river boats this turn. They're only going to purchase it if they actually have already used it. And um, they're going to, if if you do move along a river, buy river boats each time you do that move. However, you don't need to exhaust the item for the move. So it's pretty lucrative for the otters and also pretty handy for the vagabond. Next up, Cogwheel Corvids, hand card. So this supersedes the, the hand card uh, that's over there. They might do that as well. If there's an item they can craft, this doesn't replace it. They're also thinking about that. However, this one comes first. At the start of your turn, if the market has a favor card, buy it and resolve its effect, which is pretty awesome because the bots really don't interact with the uh, cards aside from like crafting items. That's the only real like card work that they do. So the fact that the Corvids get to like use the bombs that we've all been using this whole time um, is pretty sick. And also uh, first place for shortest advanced services card. Uh, next up, Logical Lizards. 
Hand card. If there are fewer than five cards in your Lost Souls, buy non-bird cards until this is not true. Buy non-bird cards. Even or Do this even if the Riverfolk human or bot has more points than you. So, this uh, helps you boost up that uh, the Lost Souls. If people are starving you of the cards needed to, uh, to get your work done, um, and also, you get to ignore <laughs> the the logical lizards are the ta- the player at the table who's saying, you know, when everyone's agreeing, like, okay, we're not going to buy from the otters. The players are like, mm-hmm, 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 except this time, um, and they just get to do it all the time. Uh, so, when purchasing the cards to fill your lost souls, it does not specify on here um, how you should do it. In term- obviously, it says non-bird, but if you have five non-bird cards, which one are you going to purchase? And I guess I would say, um, well, actually, you'll never have you'll never have five in the market because, as you'll see, the last step of the otter's turn is to discard at least one from the market. So at most, you will have four to choose from. So I would say just roll the dice: zero through three. Zero, one, two, three, um, and then do it like that. So there's actually some variance in terms of what you're taking. Um, there you go. All right, next up, Drill Bit Dutchie. Spoiler, this is the one that I might not automatically play, and I'll explain why. Hand card. At the start of your turn, if the market card has market has an ambush card, buy it and place it in front of you. As defender in battle, play an ambush card if you have one in front of you. If you have both a matching non-bird ambush and a bird ambush, play the non-bird ambush. Makes sense. Um, The attacker may play an ambush to cancel this. Now, let me get this out of the way, first of all. This is awesome. This is, again, I love when the bots have a, uh, without just exploding the overhead and the bandwidth of, of, what the bots are thinking about. I love when they interact with the cards in a in a purposeful and meaningful way. Then this is absolutely one of those. Um, so if I were in a game with the Drill Bit Duchy, I would, like me playing, not just piloting, I would 100% play this because it's not gonna happen all the time, but having four cards available to pull from, there's a decent chance at least once in the game this is going to to take place. And then that card is going to sit there as like a come at me sort of situation. Um, I think it's super cool. Now, you may have already put this together if you're following along closely at home. But the time when I would not necessarily use this, if I were just playing against other bots, I'll let you fill it in why. Ah, yes, I think I heard it, and that's hate surprises. The bots still cannot have ambush cards played against them, including from this. So, um, yeah, don't do not do it because, again, uh, attacker may play an ambush card to cancel this unless they're a root bot and they don't know that ambush cards exist. Womp womp. Uh, all right, next up, it's actually second place because it's a tie for first. Uh, Electric Eerie. Uh, hand card. This has two. If your order card suit is already in the decree and there is a market card whose suit is not in the decree, buy it to replace your order card, discarding that order card. It's the same thing that happened with, uh, what was the other one? Oh, in the basic uh, services where it says it could change the order card um, or order suit. If there are multiple such cards, choose one at random. Otherwise, follow the basic services rules. So again, roll that die, assign numbers, roll the die. Um, and in terms of the reasoning, makes sense. When the Electric Eerie starts getting multiple columns running, that's when it gets scary. Um, yes, it's it's imposing to have like four cards in one suit because you have just like this boom sort of recruit. But it's way scarier to have multiples in each one because you get to do all the actions in each of those columns. So, you know, consolidating into all birds or all rabbits or whatever looks scary and can do scary things. But it's way scarier to have one of each thing. Uh, And this is getting them to that point. Also, riverboats. 
When targeting clearings for your move action, treat rivers as paths. If you do move along a river, buy riverboats. So this is the same thing as the Vagabot, except it doesn't have the you don't exhaust an item because that would be weird because birds don't do that. Um, but same thing. If, if you essentially consider all paths and rivers as options, and if the rivers is the best one, you pay the otters to use it. Um, so really not crazy, but there are two things to think about. And last but not least, there's a tie between mechanical marquise and uh, automated alliance. It's the same exact card, though thanks to the uh, like the kerning, uh, the not the kerning. That's in between words or in between letters. But the um, what is it called? The shaping, I guess. I don't know. Um, because of the different pictures. It does not at all look like this is the same text, but trust me, it is. So, hand card. If the market has multiple cards with available items, buy a bird card if there is one. Simple. Um, and for those who know the factions, you understand why. For Mechanical Marquise, that initiates Escalated Daylight. That's good. For the Automated Alliance, Birds are, uh, bird cards are also super strong because it allows them to revolt in daylight. So they spread sympathy and then they revolt and it's bird, so it gets to target anything. Um, so bird cards, super powerful for these two factions. If no market card, uh, cards have an available item and your order card is not bird, buy a bird card. If there are multiple to choose from, choose one at random. So um, they, they're going to prioritize getting a bird card with an item that you can craft, um, then getting a bird card, and then going about your day as you otherwise would have. Um, so those are your basic and your advanced services. Now, obviously, based just on the runtime of this video, this is more overhead than the average root bot, and I'm not saying it's not. Um, however, it's not terrible, mainly because you're not really checking for a lot of things. I, I strongly recommend you put these cards somewhere where they're going to be super rememberable. So I would say like probably just plop the card right on top of Birdsong. You'd be like, oh, I need to read Birdsong. Let me move this. Oh yeah. And then you actually remember to check to see if you buy services. And that's for humans or root bots. Um, because I mean, the root bot, the rivet folk aren't going to be hawking their wares quite as loudly as a human will. So make sure that you are remembering that they are available because they will not be reminding you um, on their behalf. And last up, uh, protectionism. It's in the law of robotics at this point, but we'll get to it later. Um, yeah, it doesn't, I, I don't think it needs to be separate because we'll cover it. So setup on the back uh, is Pretty simple. First up, you're going to gather your 15 warriors. Second, you're going to place warriors, one in each clearing on the river. Uh, and point of order, uh, just remember, if you're playing with the cats, human or robot, if you have the keep down, and they, they were on the board already, doesn't matter if it's a river clearing, that's already placing a warrior, so you don't get to do it. Um, I had that in my uh, example turn. I mean, not yet because it's later in the video and I haven't filmed it. Third, fill trade post tracks. Place nine trade posts on the matching spaces of your trade post tracks. Simple. Fourth, gain starting payment. Place one warrior of one of your warriors, don't steal your neighbors, in your payments box. And fifth, stock your market. Draw five cards and add them to your market. Okay, so let's get to the actual turn. Birdsong, stock market. Draw cards and add them to the market's right side until it has five. Simple. Second, craft. The first card added to the market that shows an available item for one victory point and then discard it. Now, these are not, it is not stock market and craft. So when it says the first card added to the market, doesn't mean the first time one comes up, you do that and then you continue stocking the market. If you're missing two cards and uh, so you have three cards in your market, and then you add two more. The first card, if it has a, a craftable item, still goes down. The second card still goes down. 
Then you're going to say, the first card I added, oh my goodness, I don't know what's happening in the hallway. I'm really sorry if this is really coming through the audio. <laughs> um, you still can add that first card, which is the leftmost of the cards. Um, and when I say add it, I mean discard it and craft the item. Um, so then you will set your order to the rightmost market card, which might be affected because if the rightmost card was a craftable item, you get rid of that one and then you check the order with the next one. That's it, that's your bird song. Daylight, build and garrison. You're going to place a trade post and warrior in an ordered clearing with no trade post. Uh, if there's a tie, there are multiple clearings you could focus on. It's your, the clearing with P, with pieces of player who has the most warriors in payments. So you want to go to that person who is already a, a proven customer to go give them a trade post so they can buy more things. Simple as that. Um, recruit one warrior in each ordered clearing. If the order card is a bird, instead recruit one warrior in each clearing on the river. So this is going to be hefty with only 15 warriors in their supply they're going to be pumping out you know the cats put out for a turn no problem the, the lizards pump out lizards all over the place there are only 15 warriors in supply and they're still pumping out four or maybe even five in a turn or three if you know there's a keep and so you don't get to put a warrior in that clearing but still it's going to be a lot so you will definitely run into this not enough warriors Place warriors starting with the highest priority clearings. Simple. Honestly, I assumed that's what you would have done anyways, but it's here on the board and there you go. Third, organize. Check for protectionism. So that thing we talked about before, whoop, right in the middle of the board. We have our own little box for it. Uh, protectionism in organize, check these two conditions. First up for shield, does payments have no warriors? Next up for shorts, swords, does your supply have no warriors? If you meet a condition, you will resolve every action showing its icon for the rest of your turn. Now, I've looked around, as far as I can tell, there is nothing preventing you from having both these conditions met, which would mean you would do shield and sword. However, that would be really challenging to have no warriors in payment and also no warriors in supply. It's, I don't actually know if it's possible now that, now that I'm saying it out loud and I'm going through the turn. Um, in any case, it's a super edge case scenario. So it's probably, you're probably going to have zero or one of these. It, theoretically in an alternate universe, you might be able to have both. Um, so let's check back into organize. For shield or swords, you're going to score one victory point and place two warriors in a clearing that has river folk pieces and the most enemy pieces. Now, you might be uh, following along and saying, wait, 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 one of those conditions was having no warriors in supply. How do we place those warriors in that clearing? You don't. Um, that's the downside to the swords one, uh, which is a little bit easier to accomplish, I think. You don't get to have those extra warriors that like pop up for organize. You just get the one victory point, which is still a VP. So it's not not to, you know, uh, diminish that, but it's also not having two warriors pop up. Fourth, battle. So it starts off with shield. You only battle if one of these protectionism uh, conditions are met. You will not battle if you have warriors in your payments and also warriors in your supply. So your first at least couple turns and maybe later turns, you just will skip over battle entirely. Um, so for shield, you will battle in each clearing. Uh, not each order clearing, just every clearing that you have a battle in, you will battle there. Then you will skip the following swords line. Um, for swords, you will battle in each ordered clearing. So just the ones uh, matching that rightmost card in your market. Defender tie, battle the player who has the fewest warriors in payments. Uh, so you're going to penalize the people who have not been coming to your shops or your trade posts, I guess. And that's your daylight. So in evening, you're gonna score one victory point per warrior of the player with the most warriors in payments and then remove those warriors from payments, give them back to them. 
Um, so that could be you, or rather it could be the rivet folk. Um, if the otters are the most numerous in here, you'll score all of those and bring them back. Uh, otherwise, you'll score all of the whatever else is the most in the payments and send those back. Racketeering. If you have shield or swords, for, from each clearing, take all but two river folk warriors and place them in payments. So you, no matter if you have no warriors in payments or no in your supply, you're going to yank warriors off the board and make sure that you are boosting up your uh, victory points for the following turn. Um, it also reduces the amount of warriors you have to, you know, recruit and everything else with. So it boosts your VP, but also boosts the chances that you're going to at least get the sword one, if not the shield one, which to, for my money, the shield one seems like, you know, you get to do even more for that. So third, discard the leftmost card from the market. Um, so one of them falls off, classic like conveyor belt for uh, a game with like an open market, people to buy, uh, comes in on one side, shifts down, 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 and eventually goes away. If you have the shield uh, condition met, you're going to discard the leftmost card from market again. So you're getting rid of the bottom two. But remember, you will always draw up to five cards in your market during your bird song. So this is just getting rid of double the cards uh, to just hopefully find something that the other players are going to actually want to purchase. And that's your turn. So we, we talked about everything that's on this board, um, which again, when you're going through the, this turn specifically, it's not that bad. It is one page. Well, I guess most of them are one page. But the example is one page. The example for the logical lizards in the book is two. Um, but I guess now is as good a time as any. I did not use this example. I made my own match uh, and I played a couple of rounds, seeded the board with an actual board state, um, on the autumn map, and then I showed you a turn with the otters. So let's go over to the table and check that out so you can see the otters in action. Now remember, the advanced services which I used will have taken place outside of the otters turn, but I do talk about it a little bit. I don't completely ignore it. Um, you just won't see it taking place. So with that, let's go to the table. There are so many sounds that are happening in my recording space. It is driving me crazy this morning. <laughs> All right, welcome to the table. Um, what you see is round three. Um, so we started with cats, then Vagabot. Um, I'm, I realize I'm pointing off screen. Cats, Vagabot, and Otters, um, which were about to take their third turn. So uh, I have the basic services, uh, how the bots use the basic services, but I was also using the advanced services for both. Now, um, remember, these are optional. You don't need to use these. This is much more streamlined. Uh, all the bots will uh, work the same way, um, except uh, this, this makes them more unique. It, they, they buy the things that would more benefit their faction. So I use them for both, uh, and I have them right over here. Oh, you know what? I lied. There should be two in there. Um, so even though the Vagabot um, or Vagabond uh, exhausts an item for each service uh, that they purchase, or, or the, the bot does an item, the, the person does one for each thing, um, they're each paying two uh, because they're in the zero to nine victory point range. So. They use Otter Warriors, so there should be two in the box instead of uh, just the one. Okie doke. So first off, we are going to stock the market. So we need one card. So boop, we had another Fox card. Um, and we craft the first card added to the market that shows an available item. Now there are two items that are in the stock market, but, or in the, mar the market, but, um, the one we added does not have an item on it. So you don't act, you don't go back here and, and take these. You only take the one that's over there. Uh, and then the order is the rightmost market card. So it is Fox. We are going to build and garrison. So one warrior <clears throat> and a trade post. Uh, ordered clearing with no trade posts. So I don't have any trade posts in Fox clearings. 
um, the clearing tie, clearing with pieces of the player who has the most warriors and payments. Um, the cat well, and the Vagabot have been using uh, things, except the Vagabot's been using my own. Um, but right now, I don't have any. So then we go to the good old-fashioned tiebreaker of priority, and we go into clearing one because the keep is down here in clearing four. Now, over here on the board, uh, I placed the fox uh, trade post, which is the first one I've done. So I didn't get any victory points for that. Remember, it's zero, one, and two. Um, so had I gotten another mouse, I could have gotten two victory points right off the bat. And remember, they do go back to the board if they ever come off the map, unlike the trade posts of the humans um, who just go out of the game entirely. Next, you're going to recruit one warrior in each ordered clearing. If the ordered card is a bird, you don't need to worry about it. Now, if there's not enough warriors, which there are not going to be, um, we're going to recruit in priority clearing or er, uh, in order of priority so obviously one which is good um and then we have six eight and twelve so six now for those of you eagle-eyed viewers you may have noticed there is a leftover boot and a leftover hammer down here that is not unintentional nor is that me being sloppy with my ruins um, i was using the scoundrel vagabot um which actually uh puts down items and it doesn't fully nuke clearings like the scoundrel does for humans it just puts them in a building slot so it removes it from circulation so to speak which is really cool i will have a uh what would it be i guess a 4.1 video where i go over the new the three new classes for the vagabond um i like this one quite a bit next up organize we're going to check for protectionism um, so in protectionism, remember, we check two conditions. Do we have no payments in our, or no warriors in our payments? And do we have no warriors in our supply? So the first one, the shield, it does not affect us because we do have payments. Um, we have two of them and they're ours. So the second one, does your supply have no warriors? That one does affect us. So now we're going to take every action that shows that symbol, the sword. So after we check for protectionism uh, for shield or swords, we're going to score one victory point. Nice. I'll go like that. And then we will place two warriors in a clearing that has river folk pieces and the most enemy pieces. Womp womp. So this is one where uh, that would be super nice if you had shield because then you can have guys in your supply. But the whole thing is we don't. That's why we have the sword so we don't get to place anyone however we do get to battle so in battle if you have shield so you have no warriors in your payment you would battle in each clearing and then you would skip the following line um but since we don't have that we have the swords uh symbol we battle in each ordered clearing so we're going to go up here in clearing one that is one and O. Oh. Great, one, one uh, cat down. Uh, then over here in six, uh, one and three. So boop and boop. We got a warrior back and we gave them one back. And that's it. Oh, sorry, the defender tie player with the fewest warriors in payments, which uh, is permanently the Vagabot uh, or Vagabond because they never pay with their own warriors, but he wasn't in the clearing uh, that I could do battle in. And those are the only two ordered clearings because we only battle in orders. Uh, next up, we go down to evening. We're going to score one victory point per warrior of the player with the most warriors in payments. So two, one, two. Look at that. Uh, and then racketeering. If we have shield or swords, from each clearing, take all but two river folk warriors and place them in payments. So, these two orange clearings that we've been building up, guys. I'm gonna plop those down in payments just to make sure that we make some money next time. And then discard the left leftmost card from the market. Um, and if we had the shield protectionism, uh, we would discard two, which kind of refreshes the market to make sure you're getting in new wares for people to be interested in um, and uh, you know to go about using. And that's it, that's the turn. 
So in terms of running the the um, Riverfolk robots, it's actually quite simplistic. It is not not the most complicated thing in the world. Obviously, the difficulty comes along with running all of if you're using the advanced services or even if you're using the basic services it's all the stuff that goes on outside your turn um but honestly just like in games with the otters having them in your game is going to provide you with opportunities and things that just wouldn't be there um the vagabot used the rivers to move a couple of times which was nice the 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 cats, they use their advanced uh, services to buy a bird card that I had in my market so they could have an escalated daylight instead of their normal turn. Their first turn was an escalated daylight and they killed all my otters on the river. Um, so over the next two turns, I just kept building up in these mouse clearings. Um, and as you saw in battle, Defender is the player with the fewest warriors and payments. So this is, they are going to, it's not necessarily the one otter ball. They build up uh, a, a handful of otter balls. Because here we are, I have only three warriors for next time. Which means unless a bunch of these get killed outside my turn, I'm probably going to trigger that same protectionism again, which means I'm going to be battling, which means I'm going to be uh, scoring a victory point for free, pulling guys off that are above three. So it's, it's a very aggressive uh faction uh and if you are not patronizing them and buying their services every so often you will be in the crosshairs for their attacks and they will be able to attack pretty pretty often but that's our turn let's go back over and talk about some more of the cards that you have to deal with and we're back um, so we're going to talk about some cards hopefully i'm getting out of this recording space before uh, even more sounds are being made. Um, remember, we have our difficulty and our trait cards. Difficulty is uh, ability level of the player. Traits are going to be the play style. So I always recommend starting. The board is neutral. If you're playing with the board, that is the normal mode, um, like if you're playing a video game. I uh, Even though some people want to start on easy, I encourage you to play the board as it's written. And then, if you're like, whoa, that was brutal, then dial it down to easy. Don't start here because then you're not making a clear uh, like memory of how the board should play uh, neutrally. Uh, and then in terms of the traits, I always have at least one trait in play, but the first time I'm playing a bot, I might not. So, easy. Um, whenever you build and garrison, place no warrior at the trade post. So I don't think I need to explain why that would make things easier. Uh, it just puts out, A, an undefended uh, token, which we'll get to, that might not actually be the case in a little bit. But B, um, it just lowers the amount of board presence of the otters, which, as we talked about, is a pretty uh, presence heavy for only having 15 warriors. They are constantly going to be surging out to the board. So just, you know, one fewer of them, uh, every turn and at one of their tokens which are extra tasty for uh, removal because remember if you've bought things from the otters and you remove the token you get to get half of your warriors back from their payments box so challenging if you've been following along you know what's about to happen whenever you build and garrison instead place two warriors at the trade post so typically how easy and challenging work, they find one variable on the board and they go, here's this one, here's that one. And they plus or minus one from whatever it may be. Um, and then also uh, par for the course, nightmare is going to be whatever challenging is, plus at the end of evening, score one victory point. So you're still gonna place two warriors per trade post, but you're also just going to be Constantly, boop, 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 one victory point each turn in addition to whatever else you score. So those are your difficulty cards. For trade cards, as always, I'm placing them in order of my preference, um, the, from my favorite to my least favorite. And we're starting off with Garrison. As defender in battle, you are never defenseless, and your trade posts each add one to your maximum rolled hits. So um, this is pretty awesome. 
because uh, so just you know like we talked about on easy where you're putting down trade posts without a warrior typically that would be you know signing up for someone collecting that cardboard automatically uh, the next turn so in this case it is not remember you don't get the automatic hit that you would normally get for defenseless and whatever you roll the uh, trade posts are going to add one to your maximum rolled hits so they need to roll to attack the trade post and the um, the garrison themselves is going to add one to that roll. So I think it is uh, pretty awesome and I think it makes for a, a really in, even more interesting time um, when the trade posts start becoming the targets to take the battle back to the otters. Second place, Greedy. Score one victory point whenever the player with the most points buys any number of your services. So I think this is pretty cool. Um, now this is kind of breaking my, my rule of I like trade cards that are going to happen more often than not. This will only happen some of the time um, because A, the, the person who's in the lead might be the otters. So if the otters themselves are leading the game, you don't get this ever because you are, have the most points of all the players. And B, even if the otters aren't in the lead, sometimes the other, the player that is, isn't interested in anything you have in the market. They don't use the river and they also don't need your help with mercenaries. So um, I guess I'm boosting this one just because thematically I think it's kind of cool that uh, you're just just like pulling more out of the person who has the most uh, you know clout in the woodland. Third, ferocious. As attacker in battle your maximum rolled hits is always three. So this is this is one that will always take place. Um, and so uh, just to, to translate, even if you have one otter in a clearing and you roll a three, you still get to hit three times or a two, you still get to hit two times. Um, yeah, it's, it's scary and it will always take place. Um, but I don't know that the otters need more military might. Um, I mean, they already have numbers and just like a constant supply. This seems like it would be pretty oppressive. Um, I actually have not played with this one yet, so um, I don't know for sure, but it's my third place for now. And last but not, well, again, last but I guess least, involved. If a human does not buy your mercenary service on their turn, treat your warriors as if all of that player's enemies bought mercenaries. The Vagabond can buy mercenaries to avoid this penalty, but does not benefit from their service. So let me be clear. If you are playing with multiple humans um, and, and you have the, the rivet folk in the game, then I think this is fantastic. Um, I guess it also works if it's just one person and then multiple bots because those other bots are their enemies. Um, but I think this, this, more than anything else, makes the case for having a, a table of two, three friends, or two, three people, and then you add this into the mix. Not only does it give you all the flexibility that the otters typically do, but this is going to make for some really interesting table, like board states, because if you're not constantly pumping warriors into buying mercenaries, they just get to use the otters the next turn. So um, it's my last place because I just haven't used the otters. If I want, oh my goodness. If I've wanted to add a single bot in, um, it's either been the cats because it was super easy, the moles because it's also easy but a little more personable, or the vagabot because it kind of makes sense. It's the one faction that's totally different so why wouldn't it be controlled by the, you know, the robot? This, I think it, next time I want one bot to add to the game, 
I think I might go for this one. And it's, what, six reach? So it fills up a good amount of space because that's the other reason. Uh, the cats make a lot of matchups viable because they're 10 reach. Um, but yeah, anyways, that is the River Folk robots, not the Rivet Folk. Um, and I I don't know. I, I was kind of down on them because, I don't know, maybe I was just too small-brained about how to pilot them. But in returning to this and going through my experiences and my making my notes and making the video and the playthrough, it really wasn't as bad. And it just like broadens the possibility horizon of the game so much. Yeah, it's I think they're pretty darn cool. And what else is pretty darn cool is the fact that this is the eighth uh, Rootbot Academy video. So we are we are nearly current. We have introduced all of the currently available bots um, with a new and shinier production value. However, we still have not uh, talked about the uh, the three new root bot uh, identities for the Vagabot, one of which I used in the example term, as you saw earlier. So that will be a small little thing that's coming out. Um, at some point, I will also do the quick piloting for each of these four new factions where I, I just run through a turn, um, not like visually, not, t not doing it, but I just read through and uh, kind of walk you through my thought process of how I pilot the faction. Um, but honestly, more importantly, it's time for me to, well, play more Root, but also compose and record the next two asymmetric exercises for this, uh, the Keepers in Iron and the Lord of the Hundreds um, because I haven't done that yet and they need to join the ranks of the other ones. But um, that's all I got for you today. Thank you so much for taking a pause to give pause, especially those of you who have been hanging out for all these Rootbot Academy videos. I really appreciate it and I hope that it's been helpful to uh, those of you like myself who are just looking for videos to learn how to get these bots to the table. Um, and yeah, until next time, I'm Kyle, and I will see you at the next video. Hope you have some great games of Root between now and then.